turn that off. Good morning. It's a blessing to be back here. I was visiting earlier and uh, recollecting, if my memory serves me correctly, and it may not at this point in my life, uh, I think the first time I preached uh, in this church, it was Swiss back then, it was 1984. Uh, so most of you uh, were not around or if at that point that are here this morning. So I said, I could probably preach that message from 1984. Nobody would remember it. I don't even remember it. Uh, so I've been here a number of times, and obviously my wife, Cheryl. Uh, it was a year earlier, 1983, we were dating, and I was, asked, I was a missionary at the time with Friends of Israel Gospel Ministry. Uh, as Richard shared, Cheryl was serving with uh, American Messianic Fellowship at the time, and uh, Marvin Rosenthal, the director at that time, asked me if I would be interested in becoming the Western States director. Uh, I felt God was leading me to do that, and uh, Cheryl and I were getting uh, very interested in each other at that point in our life, uh, 1983, and uh, we were actually driving to a wedding one late afternoon, early evening, uh, going down the Florida Turnpike, heading towards this wedding venue. And I had to tell Cheryl, you know, that you know, I'm moving to California. And part of my new responsibility was to recruit personnel. And so I was thinking, you know, how am I going to do this? I said, you know, and so well, I came up with a bad news, good news scenario. No, not the bad news is sin, the good news is Jesus. We are past that in our life. Uh, and, and I didn't know which was going to be the bad news and which was going to be the good news. You know, I was, you know I'm, I'm moving to California. Well, that's great. Bye. Uh, or I'm moving to California. That's terrible. Why are you going when, when we're getting interested? So I used the bad news, good news scenario. And I told her that, uh, you know, I've, I've accepted the position of Western States Director uh, with Friends of Israel moving to California. And I said, uh, I would like you to come with me and marry me. Well, the good news was she said yes. That wasn't the bad news that she said no. Uh, and the rest is history. We moved to California. Uh, Richard shared a little bit about the journey. And in 2006, I became executive director of Jewish Awareness Ministries. So we left California and we moved to North Carolina, uh, where the headquarters is located today. Back in November of, um, it would have been about two and a half years ago, I guess that would have been um, uh, maybe 18, I guess, uh, of 18, I told the board, I, I was approaching my 70th birthday, and I said, we need to start looking for a new executive director. Uh, it'll probably take two or three years uh, to find one, uh, and when you get up in years, you never know what's going to happen health-wise, and uh, so we just need to be a little bit proactive in finding that new director. Well, over the next two and a half years, uh, went through eight different men, uh, some of them just surfacely, others who had expressed a real interest in taking the, uh, the reins of the ministry, uh, and none of them worked out. Well, without going into to detail, without mentioning the individual, we have found a new executive director for Jewish Awareness Ministries, and sometime this summer, Lord willing, he will be moving uh, to our area. Uh, he will be taking over my position. Uh, his wife will be taking over Cheryl's position. Uh, and we are not leaving the ministry. We are staying with Jewish Awareness Ministries. But we are relocating back to the same area where we initially met and served as missionaries to, Lord willing, live out our life as missionaries in, in southern Florida again. So we've come kind of full circle uh, so we are having a house built down in southern Florida, and sometime toward the end of this year, we'll be moving there. And the transition, it, it could be January 1st of next year, perhaps sooner, where he will officially become the new executive director. And uh, twofold reason for us moving. Uh, number one, I don't want him to be hanging on his coattails in the area. Uh, he needs to run the ministry. I need to be gone, if you will. Uh, from the area anyway. Uh, and uh, there are Jewish people in the Raleigh area where our headquarters is located. 
uh, maybe some 30,000 through the Triangle area. That's three major cities, uh, Chapel Hill, Durham, and, and Raleigh. Uh, but in southeast Florida, we're on the east side, there are hundreds of thousands of Jewish people. And so we're moving there where there are many, many more Jewish people. Uh, we put our house up for sale this week, this past week. So uh, pray that, we, and we, it's a very hot market there. We overpriced the house. Pray that somebody will be foolish enough to pay an overpriced payment uh, you know, on it. So uh, it's probably $35,000 higher than what it's valued at. Uh, but it's a very hot market, and um, pray that God would bring a fool along, uh, a buyer along, uh, to to buy the house. So anyway, just wanted to let you know you're the you're the first church uh, that uh, I that we have let know about the change that's happening uh, in our ministry, and so pray for the transition, pray for everything that's coming, uh, and and we have and what is it, what is this going to look like in, in the transition? Uh, he still wants me to edit the magazine and, and do all of that. Uh, that's, we'll be discussing that. Um, a whole bunch of things will be taking place in the transition. Uh, and just pray for that as that happens, as they ultimately move to our area this summer. And then the, uh, the fall issue of the magazine, Israel's Messenger. By the way, you can get a copy. This is a, a couple of issues ago. This is from uh, the fall of last year. Uh, on Romans 9, 10, and 11. You can pick up an issue if you want. Sign up for a free subscription uh, to get it. So four times a year, uh, a year issue. But the fall issue this year uh, will be uh, letting people know, not that it won't get out previous to that. It's already getting out who it is, uh, who the new director <coughs> will be. So uh, there are other things back there. Richard had mentioned the... Um, uh, my Testimony by Unshackled, there are some books that I've written, uh, the tracks, the magazine are free, everything else has a cost. But thank you for your support through the years. Um, <clears throat> I, I have been through, Will, a number of pastors here, and uh, it seems, you know, I stay and they go, so I hope you stay longer than I do uh, at this stage. But <laughs> anyway, uh, it's a blessing, and Will, great to have you here as, as you know, as the pastor of Whitewater. Um, and enjoyed the short visits we've had. Okay, uh, you have notes, and we're going to be looking at a subject this morning that is uh, perhaps a neglected area of Bible prophecy, uh, and that's the subject of anti-Semitism. And, and I've titled the, uh, this message, COVID-19, Anti-Semitism and Bible Prophecy. Uh, the Bible actually has a lot to say about uh, anti-Semitism, uh, the hatred of the Jewish people, uh, and what is going to develop uh, specifically in the tribulation period. But I believe that we are living in the shadows of the tribulation. We actually have a column in our magazine titled Shadows of the Tribulation. Uh, someone has said great events cast their shadows before them. Uh, there's one of the greatest uh, events uh, of, of all of history uh, will be the second coming, the return of Jesus Christ to planet Earth. That is preceded by seven years of tribulation. Uh, and so you have this seven-year drama, if you will. Uh, the, uh, the opening uh, night, as the curtain goes up on that period, uh, is not the rapture of the church. The rapture of the church precedes the seven-year tribulation period. Opening night is the uh, signing of that uh, peace agreement between the Antichrist and Israel and the enemies of Israel when he orchestrates that. Uh, it's very exciting to see what's happening in our world today. Um, and, and I may or may not have mentioned this in the past here. I don't remember. Uh, but certainly under, under Donald Trump's administration, and, and we'll see what happens with our present administration, uh, but the entire focus on uh, bringing peace between the Palestinians and Israel changed. <clears throat> for decades, uh, going back, uh, if you want to go back to the beginning of the PLO in the 1960s, but for decades, uh, it was an inside-outside focus. In other words, uh, we will get peace between uh, Israel and the Palestinians, and, and they will agree on whatever they will agree with. Uh, and when there's that inside peace agreement, then ultimately all of the other Arab nations will come on board 
and have peace with Israel as well. Well, there was a major shift uh, under the Trump administration, uh, moving away from an inside-outside uh, methodology of bringing peace to the Middle East to an outside-inside. In other words, forget about the Palestinians. They are intransigent. They're not interested in peace and so on and so forth. So we will try to get peace with the nations, the Arab nations, uh, outside of the Palestinian Authority. Uh, and then the Palestinian Authority will have uh, no uh, option than to get on board. Well, we had at the end of last year uh, the Abraham Accords, and I think it's four or five Arab nations have uh, now have a formal agreement with Israel, a uh, peace agreement, which I think lines up much more uh, accurately with the, what the Bible pictures uh, with the Antichrist ultimately coming, and I don't think Donald Trump's the Antichrist. Let me just go there right now. Uh, you know, when the Antichrist coming uh, and uh, bringing this peace treaty that kicks off, that starts the seven-year tribulation uh, period. And he ultimately is a, is a, a very uh, philo Israel, if you will, lover of Israel or friend of Israel. But he ends up becoming very, very anti-Semitic. Um, and I, what I see happening in our world today, and it, it is tragic, is just this uh, shadows of the tribulation. Uh, Anti-Semitism is growing, unfortunately, this hatred of Jewish people and Israel, which is an extension of the Jewish people, exponentially. And it's very sad. Uh, and it's, it, it's not only here in the United States, it's going to multiply. It's going to get much worse because there's one last large contingent of Jewish people in the world that haven't gone back to Israel. Uh, they've gone back from Russia. They've gone back uh, largely from South America, uh, from Europe. Many have gone back. The last large contingent is this country. And we should expect and we are seeing anti-Semitism rise in our country. Now, I have just in headlines for you uh, a few things that I want to read to give you an idea. Now, I have changed some of the, uh, some of the content. Some of the headlines are old. Uh, I think it was on Thursday or Friday after I sent this, I came across some different articles. But I just want to bring to your attention some of these. Um, a pastor scams Jewish clerics for a film. This is back in 2014. Uh, Steve Anderson of Faithful Word Baptist Church in Tempe, Arizona. Uh, he is a major anti-Semite. He's a pastor of an independent Baptist church, many of uh, like-minded churches, not uh, of, of, of tied in with his group, I guess you could call it, are very, very anti-Semitic. Uh, in a promotional video, Anderson said that the film, Marching to Zion, that he produced, had two purposes. To prove that the Jews are no longer God's chosen people in the New Testament, but that we as believers, we as Christians, are God's chosen people. And secondly, to prove that the modern-day nation of Israel over in the Middle East is a complete fraud. Well, a pastor back in 2015, 16, I don't remember when, uh, from California sent me this video and asked if I would critique it. And I, I, I said yes. It was, it was a very difficult thing to do. It was, the, it was one of the most vile, um, anti-Semitic piece of garbage that I'd ever listened to in, in, in many, many years of being a Christian. But I, I, I got through it. This is an independent Baptist pastor who is so anti-Semitic who lied to the Jewish community to get them on this video then, and rabbis and misrepresented. That's a lie. Uh, and, and you see this growing in the evangelical world, uh, even among independent Baptists. Baptists. Uh, there was an article last year, June 18th, in the Jerusalem Post uh, titled The Resurrection of Christian Anti-Semitism. Uh, let me read part of the article Evangelical newscaster Rick Wiles calls the impeachment of President Donald Trump a Jew coup. Says Jews are under divine judgment because they oppose Jesus and asserts that the COVID-19 coronavirus pandemic is a plague sent by God to the Jews, spreading from their synagogues to the entire world. His daily program is called, I'm not even going to tell you his daily program, you don't want to listen to it. 
He goes on, Stephen Ben Nun, founder of Israel News Live, claims to be a Jewish believer in Jesus. His daily YouTube posts regularly include rants against the Jewish state and Christians who stand with it. According to Ben Nun, Israel has made a pact with a beast, the Antichrist, in order to build a third temple, where contrary to his interpretation of the New Testament, blood sacrifices will be reinstituted. Claiming fluency in Hebrew, he uses the Bible to assert that Israel today seeks to establish a theocratic state in which Christians will be beheaded for their belief in Jesus. Now, all that is a bunch of hogwash. It's a good kosher term. Uh, it has nothing to do with truth. Um, but he's claiming to be a Christian. Um, older expressions of Christianity, the article goes on, like Roman Catholicism and various Eastern Orthodox denominations have kept a lid on their own essentially anti-Semitic convictions for several decades, even at times renouncing it. Instead of cooling the magma, however... Those convictions have simmered just beneath the surface, threatening to blow again one day. Catholicism has been historically anti-Semitic, uh, very anti-Semitic. It's been under the surface for the last 30 or 40 years, probably since Vatican II, whenever that was. I think it was in the 1960s. Uh, but it's just about to, to bubble up and flow over, unso uh, un unfortunately. Uh, the article goes on. That day might be soon. Painting in the classic style and known for portrayal of Christian themes, Italian artist Giovanni Gasparro, Gasparro unveiled his latest work just in time for Passover 2020, Name it, naming it the martyrdom of St. Simon of Trent for Jewish ritual murder. It is based on a blood libel from the Middle Ages. Gleeful Jews are depicted in the slow bloodletting and murder of a Christian child collecting its blood as an ingredient for the Passover meal. The modern state of Israel is keenly aware of the global resurgence of anti-Semitism. Back in the Middle Ages, you had this blood libel that the Jewish people would kidnap Christian children and they would draw the blood out, suck the blood out of their body, killing them, and use that to bake their matzah. That blood libel is arising today in the Arab world, the Muslim world, and in Europe, unfortunately. It is, it is, it is just so wrong. Uh, there's another article, uh, Anti-Semitism in a Major Religious Party, and I have a number of articles here. Uh, there's an article in February 4th of 2019, Why Democrats Embrace Anti-Semitism and, and, and Anti-Israel Bias. Uh, March 7th of 2019, the Democratic Party has normalized anti-Semitism. March 15th of 2020, uh, is it still safe to be a Jew in America was an article. In March 20th of 2019, the anti-Semitism crisis in the Democratic Party. And in that article, Dr. Jaffe writes this, With astonishing rapidity and cravenness, the U.S. Democratic Party has succumbed to Corbynization. Corbyn was the uh, prime minister of England who, was, who is, he's no longer the prime minister, but was and is to this day extremely anti-Semitic. Has the Democratic Party succumbed to Corbynization? Tweets and other statements uh, by newly elected members of Congress have asserted that American Jews are disloyal, that support Israel, that support for Israel is bought, and that accusations of anti-Semitism are used as weapons to silence dissent over Israel and the role of Jews. The long anticipated, few expected that the process would take only a few weeks. However, the nature and dimensions of the Democrats' problem far transcend that of the Labor Party in Britain. The potential transformation of the U.S. has global ramifications. The future of American politics and the American experience is not yet written, but the script is far, has become far darker. And it is only accelerated under the present administration in the last four months or so with the anti-Semitism of the Democrat Party. It is beyond the pale, it is getting worse, and unfortunately, it will 
get worse. There's an article, Anti-Semitism or Not, uh, June of last year. COVID-19, many in the world, uh, I know it's the China virus and, and we know where it came from, Wuhan, China, but there are many in the world that don't believe it came from China, that it came from the Jewish people. And perhaps maybe they put in China to get into the world. Uh, this article, COVID-19 has brought out serious expressions of hatred. We now have a specific form of anti-Semitism called COVID-19 anti-Semitism. Now pictures of viruses with Jewish faces are very much visible on social media. Somehow Israel is spreading the virus. But we can still celebrate virus deaths in Israel in the so-called anti-mass demonstration. Signs were saying this is the real problem while showing the Israeli flag. But instead of the Star of David, a rat was shown in the middle of the flag. There was an article just this week, April 7th. Judo virus, Zoom bombing, dark net extremism. Israeli anti-Semitism study offers 2020's gritty details. Where there's actual plague, the plague of anti-Semitism quickly follows is the theme of anti-Semitism report for 2020, published by Tel Aviv University's Cantor Center on Wednesday. Blaming the Jews and Israel's for de Israelis for developing and spreading the coronavirus, the Judeo virus, was the main motif in this year's anti-Semitic manifestations. The notion is rooted in the deep fear of the Jew-Israeli as a spreader of disease in both the past and present. Blaming the Jews and Israelis for developing and spreading the virus is a graver accusation than any previously made against Jews throughout history. Back when the bubonic plague killed some 80 million to 200 million people in U Europe, uh, it was the Jews who were blamed for that. And at least 500 Jewish communities in Europe were destroyed on the erroneous concept that the Jews introduced the bubonic plague. See, at that time, the Jews were kept in ghettos. The Jews, because of the Mosaic law, had uh, cleanliness laws, washing hands before meals, washing hands regularly, and, and germ uh, cause of viruses was not very well understood, if at all understood back then. And so when the general population was dying in the tens of millions, the Jewish people who were segregated because of the ghettos were not dying at all from the bubonic plague. So what did the world think? The Jews spread this to kill Gentiles. So they rose up and they literally destroyed 500 Jewish communities, massacring all of the inhabitants because they, according to the thinking, started the bubonic plague. It is false, had nothing to do with history, but that's what this is talking about. And even in, in modern day uh, 21st, uh, 2021 century, uh, the world still is crazy. Um, it goes on. Blaming the Jews and Israel's, Israelis for developing and spreading the virus is a graver accusation than any previously made against Jews throughout history. Quote, as the pandemic began to spread across the globe, this is the coronavirus, COVID-19, it was immediately followed by accusations that the virus had been developed and was being spread by Jews and Israelis. They're the ones who would find a cure and vaccine for the disease, selling it to the whirling world and making a huge report. One worrying change, the report notes, is that the accusations against the Jews spilled over from extremist circles and anti-Israel accusers into populations without well-defined political or ideological identities. In other words, this lie is spreading throughout the world, uh, not just to the extremists, but to the general population throughout the world. Anti-Semitism is a real problem. Uh, it's a growing problem, and it is a facet of Bible prophecy that is very seldom, I believe, uh, looked at and understood. So I want us to... Uh, in the brief time that we have, considered three points, uh, and the first two will be rather quickly. 
Uh, the first point, and it's all in your notes, uh, God demands a love for Jewish people. Uh, back in Genesis 12, 3, I'll bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee. And in these shall all families of the earth be blessed. That's the Abrahamic covenant. That promise, I'll bless them that bless Abram and his descendants, the Jewish people, and I'll curse them that curse thee. That is just as applicable and in force today as the day it was penned by Abraham. It's the Abrahamic covenant. Uh, we are to bless the Jewish people in Israel, and we will be blessed. In Deuteronomy 7, 7, the Lord did not set his love upon you, speaking of the Jewish people, nor choose you because you were more in number than any people, for ye were the fewest of all people. God chose the Jewish people not because they were more in number, not because they were better than Gentiles. God made a choice. God chose that he would work through Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and the twelve tribes of Israel to work out his plan and purpose for the world. And so I loved you, not because you were better, not because you were more num numerical. I loved you and chose you just because I loved you and I chose you. Who are we to argue with God when he makes that choice? And then in Jeremiah 31, 3, and there are so many others I could uh, appeal to. The Lord hath appeared a, a, of old unto me, saying, Yea, I have loved thee, speaking of the Jewish people. I have loved thee with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness have I drawn thee. What God loves, we should love. What God hates, we should hate. God loves the Jewish people. God loves all people, yes. But the issue that we're dealing with this morning is hatred of Jewish people. God loves Jewish people. He, it, is, it is just all through the Word of God of this truth. I have loved thee with an everlasting love. And so people like Pastor, and I even hate to call him a pastor, Steve Anderson, uh, this anti-Semitic pastor uh, in uh, Arizona, uh, is inviting the curses of God upon him uh, for his vile anti-Semitic beliefs and statements. It, it's, it's reminiscent of, uh, uh, of some of the stuff that you heard back uh, in Nazi Germany and what they said about the Jewish people. We are commanded to love all people. We are commanded to love Jewish people. It's not an option if you're a believer. What God loves, we should love. Secondly, the root of anti-Semitism is satanic. There have been hundreds and hundreds, thousands probably, of books, many by the Jewish community, trying to identify that what is the root cause of anti-Semitism. And there's all kinds of um, causes offered. And very, very, well, never in the Jew, I have never come across one book in the Jewish community world, a book by Dennis Prager, who, who is, uh, uh, you may know of Dennis Prager, a very conservative Jewish commentator, Orthodox Jew. Uh, we would agree of much of what he teaches. He's very moral against abortion and so on. Uh, his book on anti-Semitism, he misses it. He doesn't understand. Uh, the Jewish world doesn't. The root cause of anti-Semitism uh, is not because Jews have more money, not because they're more educated, not because of uh, all this crazy stuff. Uh, the root cause is Satan himself. Consider Revelation chapter 12. Now, this is the middle of the tribulation period. The great dragon, which is Satan, verse 9, the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent, called the devil and Satan, which deceives the whole world. He was cast out onto the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Now, this event takes place at the middle of the tribulation period. Uh, presently, and for many uh, millennia, uh, and into the beginning of the tribulation period even, uh, Satan has access to heaven and to God. You just remember the, the story of Job. Remember, Satan appeared before God and, and, and all of that. Well, in the middle of the tribulation period, 
Satan and his demons are cast out of heaven and they are relegated to planet earth. Uh, and Satan at this point knows his time is short. You know, he knows the Bible better than we do. He's been around a lot longer than us. He was there when it was written. He knows it much better than we do. He is just so arrogant and prideful that he thinks he can defeat God. But he knows, according to God's plan, that his time is very short, three and a half years, uh, before he's cast into the um, abyss uh, for that 1,000-year millennial uh, kingdom. Uh, But we are told that he no longer has access to heaven at this time. He's relegated to earth. And it's at this point, I believe, that he will ultimately go into a rebuilt temple in Jerusalem and proclaim himself God. Uh, in Second Thec- Thessalonians 2.4, it says this, Who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God, or that is worship, so that he is God, sits in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Satan goes into the temple through the Antichrist. He is is, uh, indwelt the Antichrist. And he goes into, the Antichrist goes into the temple, the rebuilt temple in Jerusalem, uh, and proclaims himself God. In Revelation 13, verse 4, they worship the dragon, Satan, which gave power unto the beast, the Antichrist, And they worshiped the beast, saying, who is like unto the beast, who is able to make war with him. This is uh, the the pinnacle of the power of the Antichrist starts at the middle of the tribulation period. In Daniel 8, 24, again speaking of the Antichrist, and his power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. He shall destroy wonderfully and shall prosper and practice and shall destroy the mighty and the holy people. His power will be great, but it's not through his own strength. It's through the strength of the power of Satan. And, and, he, and, he, and his, his ability to destroy is wonderful, amazing. It's, it's so uh, powerful. And he prospers initially and his practice and he destroys <coughs> Excuse me. The mighty and the holy people. That's the Jewish people. Anti Semitism. But back to Revelation 12, verse 12. Therefore rejoice ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea. Of the sea. For the devil has come down unto you having great wrath, because he knows that he hath but a short time. And when the dragon saw that he was cast onto the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child. Thank God I'm not going to be around for that period. Um, And and if you're a believer, uh, I I am firmly convinced that the rapture is pre-tribulation. I can give you all kinds of reasons for that. Uh, I'm out of here before all of this takes place. Uh, But that last three and a half years of the tribulation period, woe. Unto them who are inhabitants of the earth. It is amazingly dark. It is amazingly uh, satanic and destructive and, and what happens. And, and he persecutes, verse 13, the woman which brought forth the man-child. The woman in Revelation 12 is Israel. The man-child is Jesus. He persecutes the Jewish people. In verse 17 of Revelation 12, The dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war over the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God of the testimony of Jesus Christ. He fights against Israel and he fights against believers in the tribulation period, the latter half especially. In this context, Jewish believers. Satan knows his time is short. That's what tells us. He comes with great wrath. There is only one way for Satan to defeat God. That is to destroy God's plan for the world. God's plan for the world is wrapped around the Jewish people and the nation of Israel. If there's no nation of Israel, if there's no Jewish people, there's no 
kingdom coming for Israel and the world. There's no fulfillment of so many prophecies. Satan knows that. So with a vengeance, he goes out to destroy the Jewish people. Anti-Semitism. And that's been true throughout history. And we are seeing a rise of that in our world today. It will come to its height in the middle of the tribulation period. But with the increase of anti-Semitism in the world today uh, is reminiscent of what happened in, in pre-World War II Germany and the increase that started there in anti-Semitism and Hitler's ultimate attempt to annihilate the Jewish people. We're seeing the exact same thing today. It is prophesied. It has to happen. But as Bible-believing Christians, we should be opposed to it because God demands that we love that which he loves. Now, in closing, <clears throat> the third point. Anti-Semitism will be used by God to get the Jewish people back to Israel. And I briefly want us to consider the 110th Psalm. You're probably familiar with the first four verses. The 110th Psalm is the most oft-quoted psalm in the New Testament, more than any other psalm. Jesus would use these first three verses, or first two verses, actually, uh, in the end of Matthew 22 to confront the Pharisees. Verse 1 and 2, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. The Lord shall send the rod of thy strength out of Zion. Rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. Now, David is the writer of this psalm. David is the king of Israel. And Jesus addressed uh, the Pharisees using these two verses um, and said, The Lord said unto my Lord, and, and who is David's Lord? Because he's the writer. David is the speaker. Uh, the Lord said unto my Lord, David's Lord. David's Lord, David being king of Israel, David's Lord, his master, is only God. It's a theocracy, Israel is. So David's Lord is God. And Jesus says, how then can David in spirit, when he speaks of the Lord, uh, also call him his, his son? How can he be both David's uh, Lord and David's uh, son speaking of the Messiah? They didn't have, a, have an answer for that. But look at verse 2. The Lord shall send the rod of thy strength out of Zion. Rule in the midst of thine enemies. God's going to send the rod of the Messiah, Jesus' strength, out of Zion. And ultimately, he will rule in the midst of his enemies. But then verse 3, it says this. Thy people, the Jewish people, shall be willing in the day of thy power. In the beauties of holiness, from the womb of the morning, thou is the dew of thy youth. Thou sh people, thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power. You, know, you, can, you can summarize the Jewish response to God's message to them. In large, there's always been a remnant who's believed the truth. But God sent prophet after prophet after prophet to Israel. And, and, and as Isaiah said in chapter 30, I think it's verse 15, uh, and, and, and ye would not. And you can read other prophets and the response to, of, of, of God to the people, and ye would not, and ye would not. Uh, and, and it culminated uh, in Matthew 23 when the Messiah himself, Jesus, comes. Uh, o Jerusalem, Jerusalem. Uh, how often would I have gathered thee together as a, as a hen gathered her chicks under her wings, but ye would not. In the day of the power of God, thy people shall be willing. It's going to take the tribulation period. It's going to take all of the nations of the world coming against Jerusalem and Israel and the Jewish people, where they have no hope except to look up and say, blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. God is going to use the anti-Semitism of the world, led by the Antichrist, to force Israel into a corner. You know, you've heard the old adage, you will never find an atheist where? In a foxhole. 
you know, when bullets are going by you and over your head, and uh, you may be an atheist going into that, but you're calling on God at that point. You won't find an atheist in a foxhole. So God has painted Israel into a corner, as it were, <clears throat> allowing the Antichrist and his hatred to destroy God, defeat God, by destroying the Jewish people, that they're backed up at the end of the tribulation period when Jesus comes ultimately in his power. In that day, the people are willing in the day of his power because they've been brought to that point. Verse 4, the Lord has sworn will not repent, Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So you have a couple of points that I have put down here. You have the, he's sending the rod of his strength out. He's going to rule in the midst of his enemies. The people will be willing in the day of his power. Uh, but what you have here, you have the Davidic king and the uh, Melchizedekian priesthood. That residing in Jesus, he is king and priest. He is a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Read Hebrews 5 through 7, chapters 5 through 7 later. But I want to bring your attention to the last three verses of the 110th Psalm. The first four are regularly looked at, but seldom is the last three. Here's what it says. The Lord at thy right hand shall strike through kings in the day of his wrath. Now, when is the day of God's wrath? Tribulation period. A coming seven-year period. The Lord at thy right hand, who is sitting at the right hand of God? Who is the Lord sitting at the right hand of God? Jesus. The Lord Jesus at the right hand shall strike through kings in the day of his wrath. See, when you study the judgments of Revelation, and you start with the seal judgments, which will open up the trumpet judgments, which open up the bowl judgments. Uh, in chapter 4 and 5 in Revelation, you know, John the Revelator was weeping. Uh, is there any man able to uh, open up these sealed judgments? And I see none. Uh, but then there's that one that is able to open up that seal, uh, those sealed judgments. That's the Lamb slain before the foundation of the world. That's Jesus. And Jesus pours out the wrath of the tribulation judgment, starting with the seal judgments on earth. That's what this is saying here. The Lord at thy right hand shall strike through kings in the day of his wrath, God's wrath. He shall judge among the heathen. He shall fill the places with dead bodies. He shall wound the heads over many countries. He's gonna, there's, the, the destruction in the tribulation period is unparalleled historically. The heads of countries will, will be destroyed, will be killed, will be decimated. Uh, I estimate that there are no less than 99% plus of humanity killed in the tribulation period in those seal and trumpet and bold judgments. Just two of the judgments alone, one in the seal judgments and one in the trumpet judgments, fully one half of planet earth dies. And the bold judgments are the worst. I believe that over 99% of humanity dies in that seven-year tribulation period. And so if we have 7 billion people going into the tribulation period, that means 70 million at best survive. That's huge. Carnage. Destruction. Dead bodies. That's verse 6. When Jesus, this is not the meek and lowly Jesus. This is not the lamb who died for the sins of the world. This is the sovereign king. This is the judge of the universe. This is the one you finally, world, have brought me to the point of, uh, of my wrath has to be poured out by an ungodly world. He shall judge among the heathen. He shall fill the places with dead bodies. He shall wound the heads over many countries, the leaders. And we'll look at that heads in a section, because actually it's singular, but hold on. He shall drink of the brook in the way, and therefore he shall lift up the head. Now, these three verses speak of the Lord's judgment upon nations. It's speaking of the tribulation period. 
and is speaking uh, primarily of, of the head being the Antichrist. Note what the Lord will do, the Messiah. He's going to strike through kings in the day of his wrath. He shall judge among the heathen. And he shall wound the heads over many countries. Now, <clears throat> the issue, though, is the word heads. I have the King James. You may have, well, you're looking at the sheet, so you have a King James, too. You know. But whatever Bible you might use, be it the ESV, be it the New American Standard, be it the New King James, and I don't have the different translations in front of me right now, uh, but the King James translates it in the plural, heads. Uh, countries is the lambs, Eretz, the Hebrew Eretz, lambs. <coughs> but heads is the Hebrew word rush, rush. Uh, when Jewish people have their new year, it's rush, Hashanah, the head of the year, the singular. Uh, that comes in the fall. This word is in the singular. It's not in the plural. It shouldn't be translated in the plural as the King James Version does. Jesus will strike through uh, the kings, verse 5, but he's going to wound the head, singular, over these many countries. Who is the ruler of the world, the ruler of the countries in the world in the tribulation period? The Antichrist. That's who it's talking about. It's singular. David Cooper said this about this. The expression, he dasheth in pieces the head over a wide land, has been variously interpreted. It is quite likely, however, that it is a reference to the slaughter of the ruler who reigns over wide stretches of territory. It is quite probable that this one is the same one who is set forth as the little horn on the fourth beast mentioned in Daniel 7, which is the same person as the one who is spoken of as the king of Babylon in the end time. Henry Morris and his Defenders Study Bible said this, Heads should be singular, in the singular. <clears throat> in that day there will be one head over many countries, the beast of Revelation 13, 4 through 7. Energized and indwelt by Satan, he'll finally be crushed to eternal death by Christ, fulfilling the primeval promise of Genesis 3, 15, right back in the beginning. The head is the Antichrist. So when Jesus comes back in his wrath, the tribulation period, the seal, the trumpet, the bold judgments, and pours out, it's, it's the Lamb's wrath, who's thou, now the Lion of Judah, when he pours out his judgments upon the world, kings are killed, populations are destroyed, but that one particular head of all the countries of the world, all the rulers of the world, which is what is being addressed here in verse 6 of the 110th Psalm, the Antichrist, is destroyed. That happens at the end of the tribulation period when the anti-Semitism of the world has reached its peak. Led by the Antichrist, he has gone to the Middle East, to Israel, to Jerusalem in his final attempt to defeat God by destroying the Jewish people and the nation of Israel. Jesus says, no way. And he comes back in his power. Israel, the Jewish people that remain, two-thirds are cut off, Zechariah 13. One-third comes through and accept him. They call upon the name of the Lord, and they're saved. And Jesus, in his power, destroys the Antichrist and casts him in the abyss for a thousand years as he rules over planet Earth from Jerusalem. Anti-Semitism is satanic in its foundation. And the rise of anti-Semitism, and it's going to get worse. I guarantee, I'm not a prophet, I'm not a son of a prophet. But I do believe we are living in the shadows of the tribulation. And if that is the case, in 1948, Israel's rebirth is the key to end-time prophecy. My Bible tells me that anti-Semitism is going to get worse and worse and worse. And God has used that to drive people, Jewish people, back to the land. And there's only one place where there's a sizable Jewish population that hasn't gone back to Israel, and that's this country. It doesn't surprise me that the Democratic Party 
is anti-Semitic. It disappoints me. I don't think any Bible, and this is not a political statement, this is a Bible statement. I don't think any Bible-believing Christian should vote for any Democrat, period, because of their platforms. It's not a political statement. That's a biblical statement because it won't be too far down the road when the Republican Party will follow suit and our whole country will go against the Jews as ultimately the whole world goes against Israel. Anti-Semitism is a facet of Bible prophecy that is very real, but not often considered. Let's pray. Father, we are so grateful for the Word of God. And Father, as your children, <coughs> we, our lives should be marked by the love of all people. Lord, you hate sin, and we need to hate sin as well. But Lord, you say you love the world. You gave your only begotten Son. You died for the world, Jesus. And Lord, so there should not be a, a, a hatred, a bigotry, a, a racism, which is a false term anyway, in any of our lives. We should be characterized by the love of Jesus for all people on this earth, including Jewish people. So Lord, I would just ask that you would, would help us and just help that love for people to grow. And the best way to express our love for people is to share Jesus with them. So, Lord, help us to glorify you. Help us to honor you by loving people, by sharing our Savior with the dying world. And we give you thanks and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. I think we're going to close with...